Well, unfortunately, uh, this kind of thing does not get better. It gets, it gets worse. Um, there's already discussions that are taking place in Ivy League universities about redefining pedophilia as minor attracted persons and putting them within the, the alphabet line of LGBTQ. Some people are advocating for adding an M in there for minor attractive persons. This is, this is being discussed by social scientists, PhDs in Stanford. Uh, it's being uh, in, on the East Coast as well. I, I don't wanna name a school flippantly because I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I know at Stanford it's, it's been talked about and it's beginning to show up in the peer reviewed literature. And what you probably don't know is that most things in culture start in universities as research and social sciences that then get peer-reviewed documentation, get embraced by the medical and the psychological associations, then works its way down from high school, middle school, into elementary school, and then into the media, and then it's accepted. So uh, long before we were laughing at Ellen DeGeneres as a comedian and talking about her coming out as gay and then gay marriage, long before that happened, it was being advocated in universities by social scientists. So this is how it happens. And I think that we are, we are beginning to see the normalization of, uh, of pedophilia. Um, that is not to say, by the way, that I am equating people at all that struggle with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria with an individual who wants to have sex with kids. Those, I'm, not, I'm not at all equating those. But what I am saying is under a big tent banner, it's all sexual brokenness. And what seems to happen is the uh, society degenerates. You see this in the Roman Empire. If you look at the, the book, the classic book, The Rise and Decline of the Roman Empire by Gibbons, who's not a Christian, you begin to see that the sexual degeneration that took place in Rome that undercut the eco economics and the security of the nation, it ultimately brought it to its knees. It, it crumbled. Unless we don't think that that can happen in Western American culture, remember, we're only 248 years old. Rome didn't do that until they were 850 years old. Okay, so we're, we're doing it much quicker. I think uh, polyamory is now also being normalized. Multiple persons in relationships um, I, th this one's going to blow your mind, but it's nothing new. Every culture has experienced it ultimately, and we're going to see it, is bestiality, uh, normalization of sex uh, between humans and animals. Um, it's, it's already taken place. I'm sorry. People are joking about it. Pay attention on the media. When they begin to put extreme things out there wanting you to laugh at it, they know psychologically that if they can get you to laugh about it, you become much more open to accepting it as a reality. So they'll get you to laugh about something, and then eventually it's, ah, it's probably not too weird. But it is. Uh, and and this, this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen. This is going to be a spiral. And you're going to see everything that's in its wake. Uh, I, I think we are going to see a backlash, though, on the issue of transgenderism and um, gender-affirming surgeries. I'm, I'm just going to say it. Gender-affirming surgeries has become a billions-of-dollar industry to big pharma in our country. They are making billions of dollars, and they need a younger and a larger audience to sell all of the pharmaceuticals and the surgeries that are needed to do that. There is money behind that. And let me tell you that, uh, that it's, it's being driven by social media but it's also being driven by big pharma and it's being driven by political leaders on both sides of the aisles today because they're all in cahoots on a whole lot of this stuff and it's at the disadvantage of our children. Listen, we don't even let our kids get ear, their ears pierced at 16 years old, but we have states like Port, Portland, Oregon, where you can get a, you can get a lifetime gender-affirming surgery where they're cutting and castrating our kids without your parents knowing about it. That is an abomination in this nation. And I'll tell you what, in England, they are about a decade before, a longer at this than us, and now they are shutting down all gender-affirming surgeries because there are class-action lawsuits of people going back to the hospitals who have children and themselves have regretted doing it because most, most science says that a person who struggles with gender dysphoria is, will, will self-adjust before they are in their early to mid-20s.
they will self-adjust and return to identifying as their birth-assigned gender, or what they were born as, how God created them. They've got confusion going on on the inside. We affirm that. We know that that's happening. But the answer is not to go into butcher your body and change it irreversibly and get you on a lifetime of hormones that you can't reverse, that cause you to be uh, infertile and are going to affect things like your voice and affect things like your ability to ever have marriage or uh, or get married to a person of the opposite sex. This stuff is permanent. And so in England and in, in now in Scandinavia, they're, they're ceasing to do it, and there are class action lawsuits against these institutions. We are gonna see that in the United States of America because there's going to be a swing back uh, of that. Now, with all of that said, let me just tell you that how the church should respond, we have to be so careful that when we speak to this issue, that we are not coming against, and we are, we are not attacking individuals. Because these are people that were created in the image of God that Jesus loves and went to the cross and died for. These are people that have deep, deep emotional and psychological needs and brokenness. And the church has a terrible history of being known at kind of holding our picket signs and shaking our fists, and we conflate the political battles that we have to fight with the individual stories of people who are broken and need to be loved and need friends and they need relationships. We, we can do both at the same time. We can fight these issues and we can be uh, engaged in these issues for the sake of our kids, and yet we can also love people well at the same time. And it just takes us learning how to do that well. This is how the church is going to need to react because... Here's what I believe, is I believe with all of the sexual brokenness, whether that is heterosexual people who have body counts in the hundreds because they believe the lie about recreational sex it has no cost. So many people coming out of their 20s and 30s and 40s who've lived their life, their body count is in the hundreds and sometimes thousands, and now they're like, sex doesn't mean anything to me, I'm numb, I've been inundated by a porn culture. We need to have our doors open and our hearts prepared to help minister to people like that. Yeah. People coming out of the gay lifestyle or uh, lesbian lifestyle who find Jesus. We need to have room in our church for people who are wrestling and struggling and don't have their act together who are looking for hope. We need to have our doors open. And guys, we need to embrace them because if they're coming out of, of a community that they have been closely related to, they can't just come here on Sundays and sit in a chair and then go sit and be alone in their apartments. They're gonna need families. We're gonna have to invite them into our small groups and into our families and have a place at the table for them. We're gonna have to walk with them and they're gonna fall down and then we gotta pick them back up and offer them God's grace. People that have had uh, gender affirming and uh, their bodies have been chopped up and mutilated. Now they're trying to live a normal lifestyle. We gotta invite them in and love them and not allow any shame to be upon them and offer them hope. This has to be a house of hope. We have got to be people of hope and salvation and healing for them. Straight, gay, trans, whatever the case might be. We're never ever going to withhold the gospel because it's the power of God into salvation, but we're not gonna beat people over the head with it and condemn and shame them with it at the same time. So that would be my...